is with my lovely wife, Amanda uh, Flores. Hey, same last name. That's a good thing. Start off the day in victory. Um, we just encourage you to enjoy the service. Share the link. Share the Facebook link so other people can enjoy it as well. Hey, last week was great, and I already expect this week's going to be even better. Um, good morning, and like you said, my name is Amanda Flores, and I am his better half. Um, as you can tell by our shirts, we're kind of mad this morning. Um, that is our new sermon series. That's uh, We want to make a difference, so we're mad. Um, I do want to ask that you share where you're located at, what state, what city, what country that you are in. Um, just to let us know how far we're spreading this uh, message of Jesus' love. And also... Um, for our first time viewers, we now have an online card. A link will come up within the line for you to click and fill out. And again, it's for our first time users. Um, this will allow us to invite you to an online meeting with our pastor so that he can kind of tell you what Passion Church is all about, what we believe in, upcoming events, and just let you get to know us a little bit better. Um, and it will also allow us to send you a special gift to thank you for being a uh, first time watcher um, also if you have any prayer requests please feel free to drop those below we have an awesome prayer team here at passion church that would love to pray over those prayer requests um, the bible says where two or more gather he definitely hears and we believe that even with prayer um, and those prayer requests are prayed over none are left out none are overlooked so please drop those prayer requests below and also remember that you can give online um, your tithes and offerings, and you can also do text to give. And all the links to those will be popping up during this live. So again, you can do online giving or you can text to give. I did want to say that for all the people who have been doing live every week, we want to thank you and we appreciate you as well. We just want more and more people to be able to get the word and the love of Jesus, whether it's in person here in Bethany, you can always come, it's open. So you can always come, we have social distancing, uh, mass, uh, me and Amanda are a couple, so I'm her mask, she's my mask, uh, so to speak. But we do wanna say thank you to everybody who comes on and looks and participates in the service and enjoy the worship. If you wanna stand, you can stand, if you can't, you can't, but hey, inside, jumping up and down for some Jesus and some good experience. Uh, we thank you so much and just pray into your lives. And, and we really mean that. Um, I'm excited about this new series. If you have a servant's heart, um, this Make a Difference series is something that is going to make a big difference in our communities um, all over the world. It's not only here in Bethany. Uh, we want to make a difference in here, uh, Oklahoma, the United States, and even abroad. So um, I could guess you could say right now, everybody at Passion Church is mad about something. Um, but this is one good time that being mad is uh, a good thing. So um, as long as they don't start wearing the crazy hat like the Mad Hatter and all that good stuff, we'll be good. Um, so again, I want to reiterate that you please drop those prayer requests. Um, also, if you have anything to give thanks for, um, Pastor Steve challenged us last week in our prayer to give thanks instead of asking all the time. Um, and I have found myself giving thanks this week for things that I would normally ask for, um, giving thanks in advance of things um, that... I want and I need and that I know that my father already knows my heart so giving thanks for instance you know giving thanks for Bill making my coffee instead of me having to pray that he remembers every day so um, again give thanks Would you stand and worship with us? Come on, put your hands together. You have come, we have found life everlasting. Now our life, know your freedom, never.
this morning. He is worthy. We call it upon the name of Jesus today. How many of you know that he hears when his children call out his name today?
thank you that we can call upon your name this morning and we know that you've broken every stronghold, everything that would attach itself and try to bring us down this morning, Lord. You are more than that. Greater is he within us than he that is in the world this morning. Thank you for that, Lord Jesus.
you would clean and that you would consume a holy fire, God, that you would burn out everything that doesn't remind people of you when they look at me, if it doesn't look like you, that you would consume it, God, and you would burn it and rid my life of it today. Come on, if that's your cry, would you just throw up your hands to heaven this morning and ask him to consume you?
seconds and you just cry out to the Lord in your own way. Man, just play.
you're so good to us, God. Nothing and no one can ever compare to you. Oh, there's no one that can take your place. Oh, there's nothing that can take your place. Jesus. Since the Holy Spirit communicating something to me that I, would, I just want to share with you. I think the reason that it's essential that we learn to rest in these moments is because oftentimes he has to soften us. It, it's, it's ridiculous to think, but it's true. And it's true in my life, so I know it's true in yours, that as believers, even as believers, that we allow places in our heart to become hardened and it as, as we spend time moving from prayer life to praise life as we spend time praising him that the Holy Spirit softens those areas there are um, places in our life that we have become comfortable with that we have grown accustomed to they are our preferences but that doesn't mean they're right and that doesn't mean they're Christ-like. And it doesn't mean that it pleases the heart of God. And I think in these moments when we sense His presence so strong, all He's trying to do is soften us so that we take the restrictions and the constraints off of any area of our life and say, God, everything that I am, consume me. Even if I've grown comfortable with it, even if it's my preference, what I'm really concerned about in this moment is that you have rule and reign in my life so father we pray this morning that you would come and consume every area of our life soften the hard places of our heart if our if our heart is hardened towards someone an individual then I pray that you would soften our heart if our heart has become hardened to a group of people I pray that you would soften our heart if our heart has become hard towards you would you soften our heart today? Consume us. Consume us. We simply declare this morning that we want you. Soften your heart this morning. We want you. Come and consume God. All we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. So come and consume God. All we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. Oh God. Oh God. 
Father, we sing that we give you our heart. And in this moment, I pray that that's exactly what we would do. That you would sweep into each and every individual in this building or watching online. And we would come to this moment of surrender, whether it's for the first time or the millionth time. We would surrender our hearts to you. That we would establish you as the Lord and the Savior, the King, the ruler of our lives. We would quit pushing you off the throne. We would no longer allow our opinion to overrule your opinion. You would become the high and mighty one. Your voice has veto power in every area of our life. What you say no to, we cannot say yes to. And what we say no to, if you are saying yes, then we comply. Because you reign and you rule. And I pray that all of us would come to that place in this moment. Because that is what makes us true followers and disciples in your kingdom. Accomplish that this morning, I pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here and you have not made Jesus the ruler of your life, this is your moment. We will not embarrass you. We simply want to pray intelligently and get some materials in your hands that will help you on this journey. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up and you can pull it right back down and say, I need to establish Jesus as my king, my ruler, my authority. So, Father, I pray you'd reach down this morning and you would adjust all of us in our spirit and our attitude towards you. We're not in charge. You're in charge. You are the king. We know that your desire is to grow the kingdom. Not just our church, but you, your desire is bigger than just our church in our little neck of the woods. Uh, your desire is to establish your kingdom and to grow it. And so, Father, we bring our movers to you, 10 individuals that we know don't know your son Jesus. And we ask in this moment that you would reach out to them and you would cause them to come to that place where they will allow you to consume them, where they will come to this place where they will surrender their heart and life to you. We pray that you would do that. And God, I pray that you would remind us in this moment that the, the, the likelihood of that taking place is based largely upon our representation of you to them. And so I pray that we would do you justice and we would represent you so well that they would want you. I pray that you would do this. We give you glory for this fact that we know you're going to do it because we know this is your desire. Father, I pray for every need in this house. And as tough as it's been for me all week, even though I'm the one that preached it, I pray differently this morning because I'm trying to transition from a prayer life to a praise life. So I thank you for all that you are, you've already done and that you're going to do. And I thank you that you're going to meet every need represented in this house. And I thank you that anyone that was sick can walk out of here whole. I thank you in advance that every relationship that's been broken can be mended. I thank you in advance that every place in our life where there's lack, you're going to make provision because you're Jehovah Jireh. I thank you in advance because you're good. We give you glory for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, turn to your neighbor, wave at them, give them a fist bump, an elbow bump. Let them know that you're glad to see them this morning. Make everyone feel welcome. And then when you're ready, you can be seated and you can watch this video.
All right, we're starting a new series this morning, but I got to stop and ask you, how many of you have struggled all week? Is it harder than you thought it was going to be to change from prayer life to praise life? Anybody else? It's difficult, isn't it? But it's the key to staying and moving into the promised land. So I hope you will continue that. We've got seven more days to accomplish that because I believe it's going to become a habit for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so there are a lot of ways to say it. Let me, let me mention a few ways that you can tell people that you're mad. You can say it like this. I'm about to fly off the handle. And ever heard that one? That, okay, I'm starting old, moving up, all right, because some of you are old enough to remember that one. I have a short fuse. Anybody want to testify? I'll give you the... No. no. Um, I, I'm about to flip my wig. Anybody ever heard that one? Yeah? Yeah. I, I, I'm hot under the collar. Used that one before. How about this one? I'm about to have a cow. Why do we say that? That is so... Uh, never mind. That's a different... Okay, so that's so weird. Um, I'm about to go postal. Remember that one from about the 80s, the 90s? How about this one? This one, some of y'all ain't never heard this one. I am cheesed off. Ever? That's, a, that's a little different, isn't it? Uh, some of y'all aren't young enough to know that one. And you certainly don't understand this one. I'm salty. Heard that one? Okay, all right, all right. See, it doesn't really matter how you say it or communicate it. The fact is, is that we all experience anger. In fact, uh, anger is one of the six basic emotions that we all experience in our lifetime. It's distinct. Uh, here are the six happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, disgust, and anger. And I would say that for most of you during this season in life, that you have um, felt or experienced all of those emotions, but in particular in our environment right now, nationally, globally, uh, locally, I would be uh, convinced, and you probably couldn't convince me otherwise, that at some moment during all that we've gone through in 2020, uh, uh, it's been a crazy year, Murder, hornets, uh, viruses, uh, racial tension, economy, you name it, the, the dog acts like the cat. I mean, it's been a crazy year, right? Something during this period of, of your life, in this season, and myself included, most of us have had an experience where we have felt mad. Have you, has anybody else just kind of woke up one morning and you're just like mad and you don't even know why you're mad? I mean, you're just like, I'm mad. I'm, I'm about to have a cow. Um, and so we have this. It doesn't, doesn't really matter how you say it or how you communicate it. What matters is what you do with the anger once you experience it. Um, how are you going to handle this? Uh, so, so the writer of Ephesians weighs in, and apparently the writer of Ephesians had had this moment, I guess, I can only assume, he doesn't tell us, but I would imagine that he's had this moment where he's in, experienced something that caused him to get mad, and he has this revelation, and he gives us this statement, this instruction that should help us because he says this. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Be angry, but don't sin. Wait a minute, that should encourage you because he gives us permission to get mad. He says, be angry. Y'all ain't happy about the fact that you just, see, some of, some of your spouses, like, you need to look at your spouse because they keep telling you not to get mad. And you ought to say, but the scripture just gave me permission. I can get mad. It's okay. Be angry. You say, well, I got that one down to a T. I'm that way every day. That's a different story uh, because he goes on and he says with this instruction, do not let your anger lead you into sin. That's a different version. He says, be angry, but don't let your anger lead you into sin. And there's a differentiation there that it's this warning that anger can, can be productive or it can also be destructive. Uh, so the product of anger literally lies in our hands. How we respond. We, it's okay to get mad. We're going to talk a lot about getting mad this, this month. It's okay to get mad. But, but at some point, the product of that anger is your responsibility. There, there's a fictional book called White Knight. 
Um, it's about a detective. His name is Jim Butcher. Um, uh, he, he captures, uh, the, the author's name is Jim Butcher, and the, he writes about a, a detective, and this detective is having a conversation. I, I haven't read the book. I just found this little statement that they make, and I thought it was intriguing, that the detective is having an, a discussion um, with a demon. And th listen to what he says. He says, anger is just anger. It isn't good. It isn't bad. It just is. What you do with it is what matters. It's like anything else. You can use it to build or de to destroy. You just have to make the choice. And the demon responds, constructive anger with sarcasm. And this guy responds back and he says, it's also known as passion. Now you see why I like that. Okay. Uh, he says, passion has overthrown tyrants and freed prisoners and slaves. Passion has brought justice where there was, no, where there was savage, savagery. Passion has created freedom where there was nothing but fear. Passion has helped souls rise from the ashes of their horrible lives and build something better, stronger, and more beautiful. So our challenge then is as passion, then we must learn how to go from being mad to, to being too, too mad. How do, we, how do we graduate and transition from being mad to being mad? What am I trying to say? How do we go from being angry to being the mad that we're going to talk about, which is making a difference? How do we graduate in, in our lives so that now we're not just consumed and overwhelmed by anger, but we never make a difference. Because if you never make a difference, then the anger that you're experiencing during this season of life is going to be destructive rather than productive. So I want to help you. So there are a lot of folks in the Bible that had to figure this transition out, but perhaps none better than I can find in this ragtag, salty group of men that would ultimately become known as David's mighty men. But long before they were ever called David's mighty men, they could have probably been tagged as David's mad men because they were angry. In fact, um, I want you to listen to how the Bible describes them before they made this transition. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 and 2, it says it like this. David left Gath and he escaped to the cave of Adullam where his brothers and his father's household heard about it. They, when they heard about it, they went down to him there. And all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Another version may capture the feeling better. It says it like this. Many people joined David. These were men who were in some kind of trouble, men who owed a lot of money, and men who were not satisfied with life. Another version in the word for the word discontent says they were bitter with life. Come on, y'all. I don't know what that sounds like, but that sounds like that David gathered all these men in some hotel room in May of 2020. Is exactly what it sounds like. Doesn't that sound like how we are experiencing life right now? I heard one preacher say it like this. Those men were uh, broke, busted, and disgusted. That sound, okay, maybe that sounds more like some of you. Discontent, bitter, dissatisfied with how things are going. But somehow these men are able to, to, to take all of that that emotion, and although they started out mad, by the end of the story, they're mad. They make a difference. And I want us to examine their lives. Some pretty cool stories in there. Uh, some of my favorite stories. Uh, one in particular I'll tell later in this series, and you don't want to miss it. Um, and if you were here 13, 12 years ago, you heard me preach about Abishai. It's my all-time favorite story in the entire Bible. And I was going to skip it because I preached it 12 years ago, but I can't. I love it too much. So sometime during this series, you're going to hear about Abishai. You don't want to miss that. But today, I want us to look at this story. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 23. I want to say to you that on your own, I need you to go read 1 Chronicles chapter 11 because it retells these stories and it gives more details. All right, but I'm going to read this because it's kind of concise. Second Samuel chapter three or twenty-three, beginning in verse nine, says this: Next to rank in him was Eleazar, another one of the three fighting men. He was the son of Dodo and the grandson of Aho. 
Can't make this stuff up. Eliezer was with David at Pasdamim when the Philistines gathered there for battle and when the soldiers from Israel retreated. You missed that. I'm going to read that again. When the soldiers from Israel retreated. I'll say that one more time. When the soldiers from Israel retreated, talking about Eleazar, he attacked and killed Philistines until his hand got tired and stuck to his sword. So the Lord won an impressive victory that day. And lo and behold, the armies returned to Eleazar, but only to return to strip the dead. Now, so my first question is this, is if this is one of David's mighty men, why was he mad? And then I figured out, when you're the son of Dodo, <laughs> and you're the grandson of, okay, I'm not even going to mess with that, then you probably have a good reason to be angry, right? So, so the, uh, we don't really know why he was mad. We don't know why he was discontent. I don't know why he was bitter. I don't know if he was in debt. I don't know any of that. All I know is what the scripture tells us is that in this account that we can learn some things to apply that allow us to make the same transition that somehow Eleazar made. And so just some side notes, just a few things real quick. First of all, I want you to notice that the Bible says that, um, it, and, you, and again, you need to go read 1 Chronicles chapter 11 because it gives more details, but the Bible says that Eleazar and David are in a place called Pass Demean with the armies of Israel gathered around them. I just want to stop and tell you that if you do your research uh, and you read after commentaries, Pass Demean, which also means the, the, the dell of bloodshed, so it was a violent place, it was also believed to be the same place where David years before had defeated Goliath and also if you read about that location you also discover that there was an instance prior where Saul is going out uh, to try to do a battle and the Philistines stop him there and confront him there and David has to intervene this is just a side note this is free didn't cost you anything I just want to tell you that in my own life, what I've discovered is that it seems like in my life, my greatest battles have to be fought over the same piece of ground and the same issue time and time again. And just because you won a victory once does not let you off the hook from going back to check to make sure that the enemy hasn't set up a new stronghold in that same exact location. We talked about circling the walls, the walled off area of your life, and many of you are experiencing freedom right now that you've never experience but may I challenge you to go back and look again can I can I challenge you to go back on a frequent basis and just make sure that the enemy hasn't walked right back into the same territory and without you knowing it set up new strongholds you need to check your pause demean over and over and over again to make sure that the walls are down and that your guard is still up so, so it, it, it is necessary to keep the enemy Defeated. Second, I want you to notice, uh, and you won't see this in the passage I read. It's in First Chronicles chapter 11. Uh, I want you to go read that. But it tells us that David and Eleazar, they go out and they pick a fight with the Philistines. Interesting. I don't know how that works. I don't know if it's, nah, 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 my daddy can beat up your daddy. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is it tells us that David and Eleazar taunt the Philistines and then... In 1 Chronicles chapter 11, it says that David and Eleazar go to the middle of a barley field. And then the Philistines attack. But I want you to notice, because it's important, it seems like an, an unnecessary detail. But can I just point it out to you? It says that they taunt the enemy and then they go take up a position in the middle of a barley field. That seems insignificant, but it's not. Because the Philistines had a habit that they would always wait until the crops were just about ready to be harvested and then they would show up and they would steal the harvest. Are y'all here today? Uh, can you make the application? Can I, can I just speak to you this morning and challenge you to recognize that the enemy in the Old Testament called the Philistines recognized that if they could keep the children of Israel unfed, they would become... Uh, deficient, they would lack the strength, they would be malnourished to the point that they could no longer resist, they could no longer fight, they could no longer withstand the attack. 
So now the Philistines come down to steal the barley and David and Eliezer set up right in the middle of that crop and they say, you're not taking our food. And I just want to challenge you to ask yourself this question. Why do you think the enemy in your life continues to try to keep you from being fed? Why is it so hard to read your Bible? Why is it so difficult to get to church on Sunday morning? Don't play with me. I know some of y'all. It was a knockdown, drag out, four hour battle to get here this morning, and everything that could go wrong went wrong. Why do you think that the enemy keeps showing up on the edge of your barley field trying to steal the crops? Because he knows if you're malnourished, if you're not fed, then you won't have the ability to withstand the onslaught and you will be defeated. Wake up. Wake up. Recognize that he's attacking your food source. Okay, boy, y'all are quiet this morning. I don't know if y'all worshiped yourself out. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, recognize. Wake up and recognize. Every time you're about to open your Bible, the kids go crazy. Why do you think? Every time you're about to spend time with the Lord, the dog goes nuts. Why do you think? Every time that you're about to spend some quiet time and get fed by His Holy Spirit, something goes wrong, something distracts. It's simply an attack on your barley field. And so you better take the lead from David and Eleazar and set up right in the middle of that field and say, come on now, if you're going to attack me, you might as well bring it on. You're not getting my food. You're not getting my food. You're not getting my food. There's a common cord that runs throughout the account of these mighty men that I want to point you to out of this account, and we will see it in the other accounts as well, and that is this. If we're going to make a transition from just experiencing anger, being mad, to actually making a difference, we got to catch this. We must only fight for what matters. Well, I can't get no help this morning. And if there was ever a truth that, that should resonate in our spirit right now, in this season, in this day, in this climate, it is this. We must only fight for what matters. See, I believe that too many of us are getting mad about things that don't really matter. Now listen, I don't... I, boy, I, ooh, shoot, I'm going to go preach back here because I can feel it right now. I'm feeling the death stares. Okay, so, so in this, in this environment and in this climate, I can't do that. That's crazy. Okay, um, here's the deal. You don't get to pick what matters because some of y'all picking some stuff. We're picking sides. The only thing that really matters Y'all not going to like this because then it messes with your opinions. The only thing that really matters is what matters to God. Okay, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. See, so we use up all of our energy, all of our passion, all of our resources, all of our strength, warring for things that aren't critical to the kingdom. Some of y'all think that, that we live in a democracy. No, we don't. Not anymore. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you don't live in a democracy. You live in a theocracy. And the reason we struggle with that is because as Americans, we've never lived under, well, we used to before the Revolutionary War. We didn't understand. We don't understand. We have no frame of reference to having a king. But we have a king. Oh, man, okay, y'all. some of y'all have unfriended me right now on Facebook. That's all right. See, because here's my concern. If you win the battle that you're fighting right now, are there any spoils? Does it really make any difference in your life? Does it make any difference in the life of those around you? Does it really have any spoils, not for you, for the kingdom? Okay. See, if we're going to fight, then I want us to fight for what matters. Because I, I, my question is, is, is uh, otherwise we end up victorious, but we're empty-handed. Because some of y'all fighting, but when you're finished fighting, you may go, well, we won. On November 4th, we won. On this, on this issue, we won. On this issue, we won. But if the way that you spend all your energy, passion, resources, anger causes you to win in such a manner that there are no spoils. Because the spoils for us, by the way, are souls. And if the way you fight the war right now causes people not to want the Jesus that you have, then you're not fighting for what matters. Okay, I know. Okay, so... 
Okay, so, 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 so we've got to figure out what the king is interested in. And then once we figure that out, it's no holds barred. Once we figure out what he says is worth fighting for, then we go all in. I'm with you. I'll march right into the middle of the barley field, just me and you, God, and I will fight because if it matters to you, it should matter to me. If you don't know what matters around here, can I convince you to go back and listen? I've had people come to me and say, you need to say something about this and this and this and this. The only problem is I have. For the last 13 years, we've lined it out pretty good. Now, if you're here, or you just arrived and you don't know, then you come talk to me and I'll tell you. But we have listed it for you verbatim. What matters to the kingdom, not your opinion, what, not even my opinion, because some of the stuff that matters to him, I don't even like. Tim Kaiser says it like this. He says, our greatest fear as individuals and as a church should not be the failure, should not be a failure, but of succeeding in things in life that don't really matter. And so the first step to moving from I'm just mad to I'm going to make a difference is this. I have to have the maturity. Why do we keep coming back to maturity in 2020? Because if you're going to make it through 2020, you got to grow up. The the, the immature in this season are going to get derailed and delayed and distracted and destroyed. They're going to get caught up in every wind of doctrine. Go read the end of the book. This is the end of the book, y'all. Come to Revelation. in, In Revelation, people's minds are turned to everything but what really matters. And they're distracted. So you got to grow up. And here's the first key. you got to be able to discern what battles are worth fighting. Because some of y'all are fighting for everything, but everything you're fighting for doesn't necessarily matter to the king. I got to move because some of y'all are uncomfortable. So, so you got you you can so you, that's the first step. You got to figure out what what is the king. Just pray about it. Instead of taking up arms and fighting every battle that comes across your Facebook feed, they come across mine too. And a lot of times I type stuff out, and then the Holy Spirit grabs me by my throat and says, "Don't you dare hit enter." Because the fight's not worth it. There are no spoils for us. Okay. So that's first. But second, here, here's the second big one. Did I just say big one? I did, didn't I? My Apache Oklahoma came out of it. The second big one is, uh, is the, <laughs> oh, what is wrong with me? You can, is this, you can make a difference if you won't let go. If you won't let go. Eleazar is included in, the, in this list of those who made a difference simply because he wouldn't quit. See, I am more and more convinced that redemption is usually found in repetition. That was better than you responded. I am convinced that redemption is normally found in repetition. I find victory as I repeat the same steps over and over and over and again, and the difference is made and victory is won simply by those who will not quit. If you haven't, listen, why am I, if you haven't figured out what 2020 is really about, can I just inform you right now, is to try to get you to quit. That's it. Because you, you have figured out that the enemy discovered that if he sends one thing our way, we don't quit. But if he sends... One thing, and then another thing, and another thing. and then, Y'all think this is over? It ain't over. It, there's going to be something else. Because he's, he's piling on. He's piling on. Because he thinks it'll cause us to quit. But we can win if we won't quit. I think Eliezer's story is important because there's something to be learned here about not letting go. He had two reasons that he could have let go on that day. I'm going to share this, these two reasons because they're the same two reasons that some of you are ri- right at the place in your life where you're about to give up. And I want to encourage you, it's not time to quit. Here's the first one. The, the first reason that he about quit is because he was abandoned by everybody else. 
That's an interesting account to me. He, David and, and Eliezer are backed by, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of soldiers standing all around them. Na, 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 na. You can beat us. Red Rover, Red Rover, let all of your armies come over. And they step up into the middle of the barley field and all of a sudden, the Philistines attack and Eliezer looks around and he's the only one there. In fact, I couldn't even find in Scripture where it says David stayed. Y'all missed it. He's all by his stinking self. Surrounded by the enemy. And if there, if there wasn't a truth for us right now that's more applicable, I, I can't find it. And as this, there are going to be moments in this season where everybody you thought was going to step up and everybody that you thought was going to have your back and everybody you thought was your ride or die, they're going to set, you're going to turn around and you're going to find yourself surrounded by the enemy and you're going to be all by your little lonesome and all of a sudden you're going to want to go, I quit. I, I give up. I surrender. I didn't, I didn't mean to fight this by myself. They had me when I was taunting. Now when I was talking big, now, now all of a sudden I walk out there and there's nobody to be found. And so I just wonder, in that moment, what Eliezer must have felt like. I don't know about you, but I think he would have been shocked. I think he would have been disgusted. I think he would have been upset. I think he would have been mad. I think he would have dealt with anger. And all of a sudden, somehow he gets a grip on his emotions. And there are going to be days that you're going to want to quit making a difference because those who should be standing with you cannot be found. There are going to be days you're going to look around and it's just going to be you and, and the call that God has placed on your life and your determination to fight cannot be based on backup. Your determination to fight has to be based on this and this alone. God called me to this. And if nobody's here with me, I'll still fight. So, so, so there will come a day when you're serving and everyone else will hit, hit the road. There's going to come a day when your passion has led you to stand against the great odds and you're going to have to stand alone. But if you won't give up and you can make a difference, if you'll come to this place where you say, I, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. It could just be me, myself, and I standing in the middle of a patch where I'm surrounded, but I refuse to quit and I refuse to give up. Eleazar won because he didn't give up when everybody retreated. I know, by the way, they all came back after, they, uh, after he had won. Sure they do. Surprise. You wonder why folks did disappear on you and then all of a sudden when you walk into your blessing, now they show up. Well, surprise. But Eleazar didn't even deal with that. He just let them get the spools of the victory because his victory was that he did what God called him to do. Some of y'all are over here trying to figure out who, who should get what. Forget all that. Just win the victory. Don't get, okay. Number two, he could have give up, given up because he was tired. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 10, it says, He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary. Literally, this is what has happened. Eliezer has fought until his strength is gone. One version says he fought so long that his hand became frozen to the sword. That word frozen there means welded. Even though the situation looked hopeless, he held on. Even though the odds were not in his favor, he refused to quit swinging. One version says it like this. Eliezer stood his ground and killed Philistines right and left until he was exhausted. But he never let go of his sword. That ought to help us. Because he fought until he was exhausted. But he kept fighting through his weariness. And I had a conversation with somebody this week and I was honest with them and I said, right, this season has been the most exhausting, tiring season of my entire life. Anybody else? Anybody else wake up and dread watching the news? Anybody else wake up and dread what's coming today? Anybody else wake up and go, man, I am tired of this. I'm exhausted. I can't make the right decisions. I'm dead if I do, dead if I don't. Can't say this, can't say that. I'm, I'm exhausted. You know what it makes you do when you get exhausted? You want to quit. 
His human strength and his human ability was used up. I think that's why we're encouraged in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. And it says this, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. If we, if we think not, in due season we will reap if we won't let go. If we won't drop our sword. Some of you are tired. And I get it. And I just want to say to you. That if you will just keep holding on. And if you'll refuse to quit sw swinging. And if you'll. Let me say that differently. If you, if you will refuse to, to let go of your sword. And quit fighting the good fight. You'll win victory. I, say, I, I wrote it down like this. Don't stop serving. I know you're tired, but don't stop serving. Don't, don't, don't stop caring. Don't stop loving. Don't stop forgiving. Don't stop praying. Don't stop offering grace. Don't stop loving on people. Don't stop believing. Okay, that's my own private moment, but that's a different story. Because when you're tired, you're going to want to give up. And I'm convinced that we win victories when we learn to outlast. Those that endure to the end will be saved. They refuse to lay down their sword. I want you to notice the text one more time and then I'm going to get out of your way. It says that he attacked and killed Philistines and, and, until his hand got tired and stuck to his sword. Then it says, so the Lord won an impressive victory that day. Wait a minute. I don't understand. Eleazar is in the middle of the field fighting so long that he is exhausted until his hand welds to his sword. And then as an afterthought, it says, and so the Lord won an impressive victory. Wait a minute. Eleazar is exhausted. He's got no more energy, no more strength. I can't ush one more time. I can't, I, can't, I can't be a counter one more time. I can't do outreach one more time. I can't sing one more song. I can't deal with those rugrats in the back one more time while everybody else is getting to worship. I'm back there chasing their brats. I, what in the world? I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm exhausted. But the Lord won an impressive victory. Could it be that God's intervention is wrapped up in our tenacity? You missed it. Could it be that our miracle is revealed in our resolve? Could it be that God's hand will act if our hand stays on our sword? Could it be that Eleazar, which means God helped, maybe, just maybe, that his help came God's help came because of Eleazar's persistence. Could I say to somebody in this room that if you give up, you will have given up just this much too quick. If you would have just held on to the sword one minute longer, one day longer, one week longer, one month longer, one year longer. If you would have just kept your hand on the plow, if you would have just kept your hand on the sword, could it be that as you swing one more time, God wins an impressive victory. Some of you are poised to make a difference, but you're tired. Some of you are poised to make a difference, but others have abandoned you. Some of you are on the moment where God could use you to win an impressive victory. And I just want to say to you, keep calling, keep serving, keep going, keep pressing. Don't quit. God will use your tenacity as the platform for a turnaround. Fix your face like flint. Don't give up. Fight until we can say the Lord won an impressive victory. Let's make a difference by getting a grip and fighting for what matters by fighting alone if we have to and fighting until God comes through. So this is my question, and I'm going to share some ways you can do that this month. If, if you are honest, maybe we ought to do it like this. Would you bow your heads for just a moment, just for a moment of privacy, just between you, God, and me, and I won't tell anybody. If you're here this morning, you say, Steve, I, I'm, I'm fighting, but I'm not sure that what I'm fighting for really matters. I'm afraid I may be using up all my energy and my resources and my passion, and I'm not really sure... And I need help discerning which battle I should fight. Can you raise your hand? Pull it right back down. 
Yeah, a couple. Mm -hmm. If you're here this morning, you can put them down. I see them. If, if you're here this morning, you say, Steve, I, I, I'm almost at the place of giving up because I feel like I'm in this all by myself and others that I thought would be with me have given up. Would you just raise your hand, pull it right back down. That's me, that's me, that's me. And if you're here this morning, you say, Steve, I'm, I'm just tired. I, I, I've used up all my own ability and I'm, I'm at the point of wanting to give up because I'm just exhausted. If that's you, would you join me with raising your hand? Because my hand is up. That's what I thought. You can put them down. Father, you know our hearts. I pray that if there's any area of our heart where we've drawn battle lines that don't fit your priority list, then I pray that you would help us to learn to discern. I pray that every person under the sound of my voice, those watching over on the internet this morning, that you would help us to be able to pick the right fights. We know you want us to fight. You've called us to be soldiers. So now I just pray in Jesus' name you would help us to learn which fights are sanctioned by you. Not by our opinions, not by our preferences. We want to fight for what matters to you. So I pray you'd help us. Father, for those that said that they feel like quitting because others have given up, I pray that the peace of the Holy Spirit would invade their life right now and they would recognize that as long as they're operating in the call of God on their life, what you've called them to, I pray that you would allow them to recognize that you will not forsake them, you will not lead them, you're right there with them in the battle. And I pray that you would encourage them that even when they feel like they're by themselves, they would, they would keep fighting. And for all of those myself included, who have said that this has been a tiring season and we find ourselves exhausted, we find ourselves experiencing fatigue, and it's made us want to quit. We just want to throw our hands up and go, enough is enough. Then, Father, I pray this morning that what you would do is you would step in with supernatural strength and you would allow us to have the tenacity necessary to keep our hand on that sword so that you can win a miraculous, impressive victory in our lives. Don't let us quit too soon. Encourage us and strengthen us and don't let us grow weary in our well-doing. So that in due season, not on our time schedule, not on our time frame, but in due season, I pray that we would reap everything that you have for us in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. So how do we do this? How do we change our anger, being mad, to mad, making a difference? Real quick, two things, and I'm going to get out of your way. I believe that two of the ways we do that is two, two, two very practical steps. Giving and serving. That's how you do it. Y'all say, well, you're getting ready to take up an offering. Yeah, we are, but that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now. We... we make this transition as we learn to give and serve because then we get our attention off of ourselves and so we're going to give you some opportunities this month all month long to get involved let me talk about the two giving ways number one i believe that god has called us to reach the teach boy if you don't think teachers are stressed right now i'll let you talk to my wife and there are others in this room that are in the same profession it is a stressful season so we're going to bless this, one of the schools around us. Putnam City West High School is just right there. And we're going to reach those teachers and let them know that we're praying for them and that we care for them. How do we do that? We give. So we're just challenging you between now and the end of the month, every Sunday, bring a Sonic or a 7-Eleven gift card. There's a box out front. You can drop it in there. It can be a $2, $5, $20. It's up to you. It doesn't matter. We're not telling you how much. But we're going to gather all those gift cards. And at the end of the month, we're going to march into West, PC West High School and we're just going to reach the teach. The second way you can give is we're going to do our annual block party. We've got to do it different this year for everybody. Um, and so we're doing it as drive through But you can help us by giving. We're trying to, to raise the funds to provide pre-filled backpacks. With, they'll have school supplies in them. And we can get a pre-filled backpack for $12. So this between now and the time of the block party, if you just want to write on your offering envelope, put a check or money in there, $12, just write um, block party. We'll know what it's for. That's how you can give. But you can also serve. Because that's the second step. Because sometimes giving is not a sacrifice when serving is. Because y'all do know the most valuable commodity that you have is your time. 
So we're asking you to serve. Well, how do we do that? Three opportunities. Number one is college serve. Uh, we're going to show up on the campus of Southwestern Christian on uh, all day long on um, uh August the 14th to help students move into their dorms and to uh, get to know them and just, it's going to be a great day. So if you're interested in serving, you've got some flexible time. You don't have to be there all day. We'll give you some time parameters where you can come and serve. We need some some muscle. If that's you, then you can come see Austin or Natalie. Raise your hands. They will help you get plugged up, plugged in for that. And you can serve. Another way that you can serve is at the back-to-school drive through We're going to need people to hand out backpacks. We're trying to do some other stuff, maybe like snow cones and some things. We need your help. Last year, 1,400 people showed up on this in our parking lot for our back-to-school party. I'm not convinced it will be less than that. I just think it's going to be one gargantuan line of cars, and we're going to need people to help us do traffic. It's going to be crazy. But we need your help. And then... The other one is on August the 15th, which is a Saturday from 8 to 3. We're going to serve with Habitat for Humanity. You have to sign up by next Sunday. You have to sign up in the green room so that we know who's coming. On the iPad, you can go sign up because there's some stipulations. But we're going to help a needy family that needs a home. And we're going to serve. You say, well, I'm tired. I know. Join the, join the club. But if you'll get your attention off yourself, maybe through your tenacity, the Lord will win an impressive victory. And last but not least, out there on the uh, communication center on the counter out there, are these, these little cards, we're calling them mad tags. And these are for you because look at all these folks wearing these mad t-shirts. People are going to start asking you questions. We want you to use these tags to do random acts of kindness all month long. Why well, don't want to serve at the block party? Fine. Pick up one of these and t- over tip your waiter. I don't want to do Habitat for Humanity. I can't, I can't paint. Okay. Take one of these and mow your neighbor's yard and lay it on their porch. Whatever. But it's a way that we begin to serve people and we make a difference. Are you with me? Good. Three of you. Are you with me? Come on, Kaylee. Good morning, guys. I'm so glad to be here and so excited to see each and every one of your faces this morning. Um, But I do want to give a special shout out to our first time guest in the room. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. You could have chose to attend any church in Bethany, Oklahoma, but you chose to be with us this morning. So welcome. And we are super excited. And there's actually a card in the seat in front of you. It's a Next Steps card. If you don't mind grabbing that, filling it out, taking it to the new here booth outside, we'll get you a free gift and you'll make some friends along the way. And for our second time guest in the room, we also have a gift gift for you. And you can see Pastor Steve in the back of the St after service to do that. And there's also another group in here. If you decided to give your life to Christ today, congratulations and welcome home. We are super excited and super proud of you. And one way that we are able to walk that journey with you is by putting physical material into your hands. So you can actually text the number that's going to pop up on the screen behind me, text SAVED. Um, And then also, if you would like to serve in any way, like Pastor Steve said, in any form or fashion, because a lot of things we do here at Passion Church would not be possible without volunteers, then text SERVE to the number on the screen as well. But at this time, if you don't mind turning your attention to the screen, that would be great. Thank you. Good morning, Passion Church. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's take a look at this week's announcements. Join the prayer team for corporate prayer on Saturday, August 8th at 12 for one hour of prayer for our church, community, and our nation. Prayer is absolutely essential, so please don't miss this powerful time together. The School of Leadership meets tonight at 6 p.m. at Compassion Church at 150th and Rockwell. Teaching in theology, leadership, and specialized training in worship, students, connections, and kids will help you continue and maintain your growth. Everyone is welcome and every volunteer at Passion is encouraged to attend. There is a small cost of $100 for a family or individual. You can sign up in the green room. Are you mad? We can help you. Each week in August, we'll provide special outreach opportunities, including our annual back-to-school block party. We will make a difference in our community. Make plans now to participate. 
We want to reach the teach. Each week, bring $5 gift cards for Sonic or 7-Eleven. At the end of the month, we will deliver these cards to the teachers at PC West High School. On August 15th, let's help build a home for someone in need. This effort with Habitat for Humanity will last from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. You must sign up by August 9th in the green room so that we can get you info on what to bring and what to wear. Thank you guys so much for being here. We hope you have a blessed week and we'll see you next Sunday. So as you can tell, we have a lot of things going on here at Passion Church, and we want you involved, and we want you to invite, so don't forget to do either of those things, and one last thing before I dismiss you guys is our morning tithe and offering, it does look a little bit different than usual, but this is how you do it, so here's a couple of ways. We have the buckets that's in the back of the sanctuary, so you can go back there and give. You can give online, which is all going to be on the screen behind me, so you can give online, you can text to give, or you can give in the green room, and as you begin to prepare to do that, I do want to give just a very small testimony of mine and so about a couple of days ago I was laying in bed probably about 11 30 or 12 at night and I felt the need to check my bank account which I don't usually do but I did and I had an extra $179 just deposited into my account so I knew I had some in there but I also knew that I had tithe a couple of days prior not much but some and so when I saw that money immediately I thought my parents had possibly just kind of dropped a little bit in there so the next morning I called my dad and he actually laughed. He's like, no, I didn't put that in there. And so I knew that he did it, but I still wanted to ask just to be sure. But then I remembered that I did tithe. I mean, I did give God first um, what was his. And so another cool thing is a couple days after that 179 showed up into my account, um, I actually got a check written out for almost $1,000 just in my name for absolutely no reason. And so I just say, just give God, give to God first and blessings going to come from that. Okay, and so we love you guys, and we're super thankful for you. If you don't mind just standing with me as I dismiss you, that would be amazing. So, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for every single individual in this room. Um, I thank you for the feet that you've anointed in this place to walk into situations this week mad, to make a difference, for the ears in this room that you've anointed to listen to situations mad, and for the eyes in this room that you've anointed to see your people mad and make a difference in our community. May we just um, see thousands and hundreds of people this week come to the knowledge of you and we thank you in advance for the testimonies that are going to come out of this sermon series and out of this week and in our community and we love you and we thank you so very much for your goodness and for your grace and for your love in your precious name amen you guys are dismissed we'll see you again next week uh, oklahoma and again bill flores and amanda flores and man what a great uh service and just remember we uh pray over you all and your prayers and always send in your prayer requests if you have any as we work through making a difference um, and again if you are a first-time viewer please take a moment to fill out that online card so that you can uh, meet with pastor steve and also receive that free gift um, if you are in the area bethany please feel free to join us um, look for me wave at me i'll be glad to sit with you um, answer any questions that i can um, again we want to thank you for watching with us um, we hope that you get mad, that you take that anger and turn it into madness, um, as Pastor Steve said. Um, and don't forget that you can give You're serious this morning, but i got to stop and ask you, how many of you have struggled give, all week? Um, Is it harder that, than you thought it was? Your, um, your tithes and your offerings can be taken care of. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. It has been a fantastic service. Hopefully we'll learn where to take our anger and and all that good stuff and and like you said it's our responsibility for what we do with our anger um so we we also wish you a blessed week and don't forget there's all kinds of ways to serve you don't physically have to be here to serve you can serve by donating for the kids backpacks or sending funds in to help feed those in need because it's just prevalent as we move through this period of time in america and across the nation but just know that passion church loves you the Lord loves you for sure, and uh, keep sharing the link. Let people know what you experienced, and throughout invite the week, invite somebody. Yeah, invite, invite somebody, somebody to, to watch with you next week. There you go. Um, we, like I said earlier, we want to take this uh, the the gospel to all areas. Um, so if you have friends that are in New York, that doesn't mean they can't experience right. Passion Church. Um, you can share that link on Facebook. Um, and they can log on and experience the word and um, 
be able to participate that way. And then also, as you think through when you want to come, there's times to come during the week, times to come next week again for service, either in person or um, through social media going live. Uh, but again, it's just a lot of ways to get the gospel out there and to enjoy some worship and fellowship and have some people over at the house and do a party at your house for church. So we want to thank you, and we will see you next week. God bless.